Computers can easily store images as pixel values in an array, but how can we make them actually interpret these images meaningfully? For example, let's say we have this image of a dog, and we want the computer to tell us what this is. One way to do this is to have these templates that check for a certain structure within an image, or maybe have this terrible looking mean image averaged across many dog images to check for similarity. But these can be very limited and non-effective for more unique cases. And clearly, the computer is doing a very poor job at grabbing the essence of what makes a dog here. One perhaps more promising approach is to treat vision as hierarchical. In that case, it would go through many phases of feature capturing, each going up one level of complexity. For example, the computer might first look for oriented edges in the image, and then start looking for shapes or textures, each building on top of the other, until it starts looking for eyes or legs and so on. In any case, this video will be part of a two or three video series, depending on how much I decide to split things up, where I'll basically be giving a brief introduction to deep learning for computer vision. This video specifically will be focusing on building the foundational blocks of neural networks in general. And then in the next few videos, I'll be focusing on convolutional neural networks and how its architectures and best practices have evolved over the years. Okay, so first I think we should start off by explaining what a neural network is. Let's look at an example of a neural network consisting of a single unit and generalize from there. To make things concrete, let's say we take an image and unroll its pixels such that they're represented by a long vector. And here I'll only show a small portion of the vector to actually fit in the screen. And so then, the goal of the network is to say whether the image is of a bird or a frog. Outputting 1 if it's a bird, or 0 if it's a frog. So, at the beginning, each input element is multiplied by its corresponding weight visualized by these lines connecting the node to each element to the vector. We then sum up all these lines. In other words, we are taking the weighted sum of the input vector. Note that in practice, we also commonly add a bias along with each weight. And so, then the sum is passed into some nonlinearity, in this case, the sigmoid function, which squishes our output into a range of 0 to 1, which can be interpreted as a probability. Then we can say that if the network outputs a value greater than 0 0.5, then it's a cat, else it's a dog. By the way, what we've just implemented is logistic regression interpreted as a single unit neural network. Let's say that we formulated a problem such that we're trying to minimize the mean squared error between the value our model predicts and the ground truth value that we have over a set of images. And for that to work, we choose to have one class representing one and the other zero. For example, in our case, one represents a bird and zero represents a frog, as we've said earlier. We call this our loss function. Okay, but assuming we start off from a randomly initialized set of weights and biases, which I will now call the parameters of the network, then how the heck do we find the most optimal set of parameters that minimize this loss function? Well, one way to do this is to try to tweak each parameter and then see whether increasing that parameter or decreasing it will decrease our loss. If we keep doing this iteratively for a thousand years in our example, then maybe we might end up with a good solution. But I think this is less than optimal in the real world. Alternatively, when we formulated our neural network, we made sure that every operation is differentiable, meaning that via the chain rule, we can gather the partial derivatives of our loss function with respect to each of our parameters. These derivatives are essentially telling us how much will the loss change if we change this parameter? This isn't just information about whether to increase or decrease this parameter, but also how much as well. Since we want to minimize, aka decrease our loss function, we can decrease our parameters by their derivatives multiplied by some small constant we call the learning rate. It isn't enough to do this once, 
We do this iteratively for many times, each time gathering the required partial derivatives and then subtracting our parameters by the learning rate times their partial derivatives until it looks like our network's loss is no longer decreasing significantly. And now we have our trained and working model. Note that what we've just described is an algorithm called gradient descent. And as you can see from this graph, when we have only one parameter to optimize for, gradient descent can be visualized as descending to this graph's closest local minima based only on derivative information. Or if we have two parameters to optimize for, here's a 3D visualization of the algorithm. And beyond two parameters, it becomes way more difficult to visualize gradient descent since we can't just draw a 4D graph, for example. You might have noticed that these graphs are represented have many local minimas, which exposes one downside of vanilla gradient descent, and it's that it's very susceptible to local minimas. This can be a problem to our neural networks since they are very non-convex, which is why you'll often see alternatives that build upon gradient descent and try to tackle these downfalls. In reality, Using a single unit is hardly enough complexity to learn the various computer vision tasks. Therefore, we can extend to both have more units per layer and more layers. The interpretation now is that each layer's nodes are fully forward connected to the following layer's nodes. This adds a ton of complexity to our network. In fact, it's been proven that by just using one hidden layer between our input and output, that our model can learn to approximate any function given enough units in that layer. Now, although this idea of universal approximation is interesting, and it gives us a hint that neural networks are a powerful way to do various tasks, we shouldn't put too much faith in it because other techniques such as k-means neighbors also have this property of universal approximation, and yet they are very clearly inferior to neural networks in their ability to generalize. I think now is a good time to introduce some notation and how we can represent these neural networks as affine transformations followed by nonlinear transformations. So if we represent the outputs of each layer as A and our weight sums plus the biases as Z, then we get the following set of equations for each layer. You should look at this for a while and see where all the indexing comes from, as I think that's the best way to get it quickly. Now, you may notice that the activations of the previous layer are repeated in each equation. As a result, we can represent this as a matrix multiplication plus the bias as follows. We then take the element y sigmoid of the vector that we get, and this gives us a vector representing the activations of the next layer. This can now cleanly be represented as an affine transformation followed by a nonlinear transformation to give us the next layer's output. So one question that might pop up is, why do we add nonlinearities instead of just chaining these affine transformations? Well, it turns out that that's not very useful. As an affine transformation plus an affine transformation simply gives us another affine transformation. So that way adding more layers won't actually increase our network's capacity. Also, not all things are linearly separable. For example, let's say that here we want to separate these inner dots from the outer dots. There is no single straight line that can separate these into two different boundaries. But if we do this feature transformation to our original space, which is a nonlinear transformation, then we end up with a space where the dots are linearly separable. And then if we do the reverse transformation to this linear boundary that we just created, then we get this very nonlinear boundary line in our original space. And so, this is another way to interpret what neural networks are doing. And it's that they're carving out these very nonlinear boundaries that can, for example, separate a bird from a frog, given the input images. Now, when it comes to training multilayer models, it really comes down to the same thing. All we have to do is gather the derivatives of the loss function with respect to all the weights and biases that we have. The main difference here is that the neural networks has gotten vastly more complex and it's not immediately clear 
how we can gather these derivatives. The method that's currently used to do this is called the backpropagation algorithm, which as important as it is, I will not explain in this video due to me trying to keep this video as short as possible. But also, even in practice nowadays, we make use of these autograd engines who pretty much do all of this for you under the hood and you never have to implement it yourself. Now it's still very important to understand the algorithm fundamentally, which is why I'll put links in the description for sources that I found very useful when I was first struggling with backpropagation. What we've actually just introduced as multilayer neural networks are fully connected feed-forward neural networks which are not the only type out there, and they aren't the best class of models for computer vision, but the core ideas explained in this vid are still the same across all types of networks. Now if you remember, in the fully connected layer case, we ended up flattening our input image into a long vector. But in reality, this is super wasteful. We've just gotten rid of all spatial information in the image, which sounds really bad. What we want is some way to process this image such that we directly take into account spatial information. In other words, without flattening the image into a vector. This is one of the main things that we will get into in the next part of this series, by introducing convolutional neural networks. In the next video, we will also go through concrete examples of how we train models, as well as comparisons between convolutional neural networks and fully connected ones. So, stay tuned!